Well, good evening. We are so glad that you decided to come back for this Sunday evening service, and we are so glad to have you. Here we are uh, going to sing a couple songs, but uh, I want you to be thinking about uh, some testimonies that you might have. So as we sing this first song, right at the end of it, we'll take a couple testimonies. So be thinking about it uh, so that you can, uh, you won't be the first one up, you can be the second one up. Okay, so when I ask who's ready, you can say, oh, I'm ready, I'm the second one up. So you don't have to be nervous to be the first one. You can just be this, okay, let's sing. 125, take your hymn books, 125 here. He giveth more grace. You want to stand as we sing this first stanza? the Lord in prayer. You want to pray? Thank you. Uh, the song's for us tonight. Um, thanks for coming out. Um, I've just been having a bunch of sneezing and headache like crazy. Um, you know what's going on. I, I think it's like the Lord took us out of the fridge of winter, put us on the counter, and we've hit room temperature. And then He decided to cover us and smother us with all kinds of seasonings of pollen. And then this last week He put us back in the fridge to marinate. I think that's what's going on here, and it's got to work its way through in a little bit of a process. But we do have our bells class going on, our chimes going on tonight. Thank you for coming out. The last time you could ever have an evening service, because of course tomorrow it's the end of the world. So we're going to study about the eclipse and learning about that. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's blessing. Father, I thank you that we can meet here tonight. Lord, we have a hunger and desire to know you and to know your word. We pray that you bless as we sing. May we open our hearts and give praises to you. And Father, we pray for these testimonies that you'd be glorified. And I pray thanking you for what you're doing in hearts and lives. Thank you for uh, just seeing Tom Callahan tonight, Lord. I, I thank you for just saving his life. And he's with us tonight. And I just continue to rejoice. And all of us, Lord, our breath right now is in your hand. Any one of us could pass from this life or you could return at any moment. And Father, we thank you that we are here tonight to worship you together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Amen. Well, when it comes to testimonies, I'll go ahead and be first, and that way you can be second. So uh, we had a uh, few folks show, uh, showed up for boiler room prayer this morning at 845, and as I was here and just uh, in the quietness of the room was able to pray. Aren't you so glad that God answers our prayers? Amen. And, you know, sometimes we forget that. But I I'd prayed specifically for two things and um, ironically walked over to the Sunday school room over there. And one of them walked through the door. 
And I was like, yes. And I uh, said, thank you, Lord, for answering that prayer. And then came in here. And uh, with the number of visitors, uh, God had answered that second prayer. I was like, Lord, thank you so very much that you answer uh, our prayers the way that you do. And so what a blessing. Amen? Amen. All right. So who would be second with a, with a testimony? Anyone? Yes, Brett. I'll praise the Lord for, uh, I'll just add on to yours, because I've been very impressed with God leading people to this church, which tells me that a number of things about Cross and Crown. It tells me it's got a good reputation. People are willing to come. It tells me that people are telling them about Cross and Crown, that they do come and, and know where to come. And it also tells me that God is still using this church in a mighty way. Somebody um, to bring. Amen. What a blessing. That is so good. Thank you. Who will be next? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I met um, this guy on, on the back um, Friday, and I gave him one of the church. I said, oh, it's good because my wife is looking for a church, and she's a Christian. So just pray his name is Raymond. But let's see. Uh, Amen. Amen. Raymond at the bank, look, his wife looking for a church. So yes, yes, Miss Bonnie. We spent the day with uh, Carol Yarbrough, who was here. Went to her home. I mean, we spent the day, went out for lunch, then I went to her home. And her husband didn't go to work today, but I invited him back to her and said, people were asking about you, and I said, we're missing you. Amen. And he almost promised that he'd be here next Sunday. <laughs> I didn't say I'll keep it to it. I said, I'll see you next Sunday. Yeah. I said, we all love you. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Amen. What a blessing. And, and praise the Lord for the uh, Resurrection Sunday last yeah. week. Uh, 100 and almost 60 wow. here in attendance. Uh, we had every chair with the exception of five. And I, I moved those into pastor's office. But every chair that we have was set out except for five and it was pretty 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 full there so uh, praise the lord for that that god is working in a mighty way anyone else i saw somebody else did i say a hand over here okay well we'll give you another song to think about it so aren't you glad that we can say that when it comes to counting us for the kingdom of god that jesus included me 355 in your hymn books, 355. You can remain uh, seated, but uh, we'll sing at least the first stanza, and then we'll go from there. If he's included you, then we should have testimony to be able to give back to him. Amen? So who'll be next with maybe a testimony, word of praise? Yes, Miss Sherry. Um, I just want to thank the Lord for 
answering prayer. I was talking with someone yesterday, and I was kind of sensing a resistant spirit there. But I just, um, after I got done talking, I just prayed the rest of the night, and then I heard something today that um, showed me they were more sensitive. Amen. Amen. And you know, sometimes we have to, sometimes we can talk, but sometimes I found it's just better just to stop and just give it over to the Lord and just to say, Lord, let you deal with this. Because the Lord can deal with it a whole lot better than we can most of the time. No, no, all the time. <laughs> so praise the Lord for that. I saw another hand here. Yes, sir. I just uh, praise the Lord for God's word. Is you've studied previous chapters or verses and stuff, then you go back and you study it and you learn constantly you learn new things and things that you say you know. Mm. It's just a blessing. Amen. Amen. It's so the beauty about the Word of God. You can never exhaust the uh, the truth, the wisdom that you find in it. Amen. It's new every day. Yes, Miss Bonnie. God still answers prayer for two days. It's party and Saturday. I was in so much I'm so grateful that he enters prayer and, and uh, healing, you know. So we're, I'm so grateful to have Sherry here with us and after this surgery that she's doing a lot better and Tom Callahan sitting there. And, and so we praise the Lord uh, for these answers to prayer. And that, who will be next? Yes, Tom. I just want to share one thing with you guys. I appreciate the prayers that you gave me. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. This shows. This goes to show you, God's not done with you yet, it's brother. Yeah. God's not done with you yet. Yeah. All right. Who'll be next? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. you too well, we're glad that you and your mom and dad found this church and grandpa and grandma and aunts and uncles and Bob and Bill and filled the whole pew so praise the Lord anyone else who'll be next who'll be next oh yes ma'am the Lord. Amen for that. All right. Anybody want to be next? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Amen. You know, it's such a blessing when you come in on Sunday mornings and everybody's kind of doing their thing, you know? Uh, some people in there finishing up coffee, some of them there setting up tables, some in there just going immediately to, you know, for crowd control, security. I mean, it's just, it's just neat to see how God's people just kind of jump right in and fill those spots. No complaint, no, no murmuring, just glad to be able to serve. And it's just a joy to walk into an environment like that. What a blessing. And, and I, I say thanks to the Lord, but thanks to you as well for just rolling up your sleeves and making her happen. Who will be next? Anyone? Yes, Miss Donna. We can't leave the pastor in this campground. That is just wonderful. They work hard. Mm -hmm. They feed their sheep. And we just had a wonderful shepherd. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. She said you're a really neat guy, too. All right, anyone else? Don't want to cut anybody off. Yes, Diane. I want to thank the Lord for Pastor's message this morning. Yes. Um, I was raised in a Christian home. You know, I've read through the Bible many, many times. Even did a study on the names of the Lord, of God. And this morning, it was just a, a new eye opener. Yes. That the Lord is our Redeemer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that whole thing about with uh, Jesus being God. That is the difference between heresy, cults, and truth. That one statement right there. And settling that and being able to go back to the Word of God just like we did this morning and say, here's the verse, here's the verse, here's the verse. And I was like, thank you, Lord. And some of the folks sitting here that I know that have been struggling with this and uh, were right here this morning being able to hear that. And I thought, praise God. All right, anyone else? Yes, Doug. Uh, thank the Lord for the opportunity to talk to my brother. And he's in a, he was in a hospital in Fort Worth. And uh, talked to him about salvation. And uh, assuredly, he does know Jesus Christ is his Savior. He was confident of that and uh, confident of where he's going when he dies. And uh, very thankful that uh, he is saved. Mm. Amen. Amen. Just pray for Michael and Skinny, his wife. She's exhausted from taking care of him. Yeah. It was a blessing. He spent about a total of five hours. We saw him twice. saw him twice while we were on vacation this past week. So it was a good thing. We had a blessing this week in that uh, we just had a brand new chaplain join us from up in Michigan, and he became a hospice chaplain. And so uh, we have two hospice chaplains now. And I'm telling you, what a tremendous ministry of the local church to have a chaplain that's in the hospice because here's people who are getting ready to go out into eternity. And to be able to have someone to be able to share the gospel with them and the family members who are struggling as they're sitting there watching that one fade quickly in some cases, to be able to comfort them and pull up alongside of them and to have people that I know for sure, that know the truth of God uh, becoming the chaplains. And, and many, many hospice organizations are actually asking for chaplains to come and be a part of their, their team. Isn't that amazing? So praise the Lord. But uh, all right. Anyone else? Don't want to cut you off. If not, we're going to sing a song here, The Glorious Church. And just after that, we'll take our offering uh, for this evening. So we'll sing this song and... Uh, Right after that, it'll be a time of offering, and then maybe one other song, and or pastor just turn them loose, right? So let's stand as we sing this last song, um, uh, 576. 576, a glorious church. Father, we thank you for this time that we are able to uh, set aside, even in our time of worship, a time to where we are able to give back unto you that which you have so bountifully uh, 
blessed us, us with. Lord, uh, we are truly rich as a nation, Lord, and Lord, um, we have because you have so uh, wonderfully given unto us. And Lord, for the, for the work of this ministry to continue to go on, uh, I know that you don't need our money. Uh, you own the, the cattle on a thousand hills. But yet it's a way for us to come back and to worship you and to say thank you for what you have given unto us. And I pray that even during this time, that as we give, that we would give with a cheerful heart. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've blessed us with. In Jesus' holy and precious name, we do pray. Amen. Let's sing one last song here before uh, Pastor comes and shares about Doomsday tomorrow. So, um, and I really, if, if it is Doomsday tomorrow, then you're going to want to sing this song, Say by the Blood of the Crucified One. So, why don't we uh, go ahead and uh, stand one last time here, 375, 375, Say by the Blood of the Crucified One. dismissed at this time as well. be seated. Amen. We're going to have some more folks joining us in just a moment as they come in from their bell time and their chime time. But let's go ahead and take our Bibles here and let's get into uh, this very interesting topic about 
um, what's going on tomorrow. And I don't normally talk about the news and about what's going on, things like that. We need to stick to the scriptures. However, this is going to be a good springboard for us to learn something. And uh, the Lord laid it on my heart. And uh, you'll be surprised how many people are actually talking about this everywhere. We've been joking a little bit tongue-in-cheek about this, and, uh, but there are some people who are very troubled by this. And we want to be a blessing, and you can take some of this information and share it at work tomorrow. But as it goes, here's some of the material that is going around right now. That this eclipse... That is going to happen, and by the way, we are just 90 miles away from the edge of the path. So if you wanted to hit I-24 as you go straight up to Paducah, you can cross the river into southern Illinois, and as you do, you'll be right there in the path. You will be able to be in a traffic jam like no other, I'm sure, uh, along the interstate. Uh, Airbnbs are booked up all over. If you look at the actual path of where this eclipse is going to be, and look at the number of Airbnbs being rented. It is the exact path all the way through. <laughs> My sister in northern Maine said they, their town on a very, very good day is 500 people. And that's people coming in for seasonal ski activities and things like that or hunting. And she said, man, we got crazy city slickers all over the place up here. <laughs> and so uh, they're just coming out of the woodwork and they're wanting to look at this. It's amazing. If you've never done it before, I actually sat in a lawn chair seven years ago and watched it go straight over. Uh, where I was sitting. Uh, when I walked over to Mama Lucas's house, all the family had come up from Florida. We really enjoyed that time together. And I tried, I'm gonna, this is my chance in a lifetime. I'm gonna take my camera, 35 millimeter. I'm gonna set it all up. I'm gonna snack. Yeah, I gave up halfway through. I'm worrying more about this than enjoying the moment. And so I sat back there and uh, put on those, those special glasses and uh, just enjoyed it. And I don't have any good pictures from it. What I had done earlier, years and years ago, is back in the 90s, I don't know when, probably around, I'm guessing, based on Kyle's birth, um, it'd be probably 95, uh, 1995, uh, there was a solar eclipse where I was living in Florida. And so I had a video camcorder, and I set it on a tripod, pointed it directly at the sun. I didn't look at the sun, I just looked through the viewfinder, pointed that thing up there. I ran like a 30-foot cable in and plugged it into my TV, and I watched it on TV. That's another idea, to protect your eyes. Other people have been telling me different things that they've done. Some are going to look in, in the water and watch it in reflections. Uh, very interesting. But this is like no other. This one is going to be a message from God. Seven years ago, the path that the, uh, the, the solar eclipse took crossed America, and it passed seven cities named Bethlehem, the sign of Christ's first coming, a sign of peace and tranquility and goodness. This one, seven years later, and seven is the magic number, it passes over Aztec ruins. It passes over the Memphis Pyramid. It passes over 50 million Americans. This is certainly a sign of the apocalypse. This will also pass over seven places called Nineveh, the sign of God's destruction. This refers to Christ's second coming. And that it happens seven years apart is just astounding. There, the eclipse pass cross at a place called Little Egypt. Do we have a picture of that? Uh, if we can switch over to that. I just want you to notice how scary this is. Just northwest of us in southern Illinois, the top line is the 2017, and the other one coming up higher to the right is the 2024. These two together cross in the same region called Little Egypt. Interesting. It actually refers to southern Illinois which Southern Illinois is known generally as Little Egypt. There's no city called that because it's a confluence of rivers and where they come together, there's a town called Cairo. Uh, and so we have a lot of biblical places that this is coming across. So this is a wake-up call to America. Well, Pastor, what do you think? I think there's a lot to be shared since the fact that... Um, we have nine towns named Nineveh. This also occurs on the 99th day of this year. 
So we all know that 999 turned upside down is 666. I'm here to warn you that the apocalypse is about to happen. Now, if I'm wrong, then uh, you'll go your merry way. But if I'm right that the Lord comes back tomorrow, um, then uh, you can thank me that you were ready. We're, we're joking about this, but how do we answer this biblically? I'm not here just to make fun of anything like that. I just want to really, really help you grow to learn to discern things biblically. So let's go ahead and pray and ask for the Lord's help. God, we open your word now. We pray that you teach us. Pray that you'd guide me, help me to share these thoughts, simple thoughts that can be a blessing to these folks as well as those that they work with and their family members and other people that are really confused. They have no foundation. They have no guidance. They have no indwelling Holy Spirit. They have no light. And they may be confused. And so I pray, Father, that you would teach us discernment and how to share the scriptures with them. In Jesus' name, amen. As a pastor, I want to just share with you like a shepherd. I want to guide you in helping you understand that we ought to ask some questions. Whenever you hear these things, there will always be discussion. So engage yourself into the discussion. Be kind, be sweet, be salt and light to those around you. As you are working around people and living with people, make sure that you take that opportunity to engage them. It's okay to talk to them, but let me ask you these five questions uh, that will help you. Question number one, is any of this in the Bible? Not that I know. I think it's interesting that you can take the two cross, and this forms a cross, by the way. Um, Carissa, can you show us the next one, uh, the next map? What about the one that occurred uh, in between the two? Um, that was last year, October 14th of 2023. It wasn't a full complete, but it was partial. And uh, it streaked across from Washington State on down through Texas. Um, we're not talking about them because it messes up the picture of the cross. But someone said, doesn't that form the Hebrew letter Aleph? I said, not really. Aleph looks much different. That looks more like an A to me. Um, but um, why are we just sticking with two or three? Why don't we just lay across all of them that have occurred in the last so many years? It would be just a conglomeration of, of all kinds of paths and lines. And so my question is, is any of this in the Bible? Now, we are all learning the Bible, and we are all learning to study it more. Let me just mention this. That's the number one question that we always ask. Is this in the Bible? Along with that, under this first question, I would say, in what I, is what I he I'm hearing right now from this person, is this person adding to Scripture? When you listen to them and these Facebook videos that people are posting and sharing and liking and spreading around, it's almost as though this person is acting like a prophet and saying, well, we all know, look at the... And I watched one that was so, he was so good talking and smooth talker. I mean, he was just so interesting. And it, he gave all these arguments. Never once did he open the Bible. Wow. Okay, so... We've got people that are just liking and sharing. Got to be careful. Ask this first question. Is this in Scripture? Well, if it's not, let's go to some Scripture that we do have. Let's look at a few verses. Mark chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Mark chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. While you're turning there, let me just mention to you that I told my wife on the way over here tonight, I said, I hope I don't step on anybody's toes. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. There may be some that don't really appreciate what I have to say tonight, and that's okay. I love you. I love those who are watching, and I'm not making fun of anybody. Um, I'm just trying to help us, like a good shepherd should do, is let's go to the Scriptures. There's many things I don't understand. Many things God is doing that I don't understand. But from my perspective, I always go back to that which I can stand firmly upon, and that's the Scriptures. What do we have? Mark chapter 8, look at verse 11 and 12. The Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven. 
tempting him. And he sighed. He, this is how God is grieved. He sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. What is the next thing that is on God's timetable? His return in the clouds, in the air, to snatch up those that have died first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 4. That's the next thing, and, and we're not going to see that sign until we're on the way up. Okay? And we'll be radically changed. First Corinthians 15, it's going to be fantastic. We're, there's not, Jesus is not going to give a sign. So, that's important. This is the scripture we do have. Turn to Mark 11, verse 32. Um, I may have the wrong reference down. I will have to come back to that. Okay, Luke 11, Luke 11, 29. Luke eleven twenty nine. When the people were gathered thick together, I love Luke. He's, he's so descriptive. Mark is very descriptive. Luke is, is in his own way. But he says, when the people were thick together, I mean, that's almost like when I've gone to a Titans game and you're trying to get into the game and they're just like shoulder to shoulder, COVID, here we come. You know, just we're going to go on in there and it's just like so crowded. He says, when the people were thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign. There shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonah was, th the sign, uh, was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Wow. The only sign that we're going to have is the fact that Jesus died and was buried for three days and then he rose again, like Jonah was in the belly of the whale. We've already received that sign. That's what Jesus is saying. God is saying to us, pay attention to that sign. That's the only one you need. You don't need any other. That's the one you got to focus on. So those are some interesting thoughts there. What's the first question you ask? Is any of this in the Bible? Okay. Number two, is there a false prophet today? Are there false prophets today? Now, let me tell you this. If you're trying to hit, get a lot of likes on Facebook, or if you're trying to get a lot of attention from people and grow a church, uh, I don't know how well you grow it, but if you want to get a lot of numbers in and get attention, what do you do? You put yourself out there, and Danny? Preach on, on Revelation, right? Danny knows. Danny works in our technology. He's seen that on our website, we have hundreds and hundreds of videos. He said, Pastor, did you see all these videos on Revelation have had over like 1,500 views? I mean, things like that. So that's interesting. You do that, but also you try to get a very questionable thing and you, and you start preaching on it. And with Facebook, if you want a lot of hits and shares, you put something far out out there. And people will do that without even checking it out. So there are many, many types of speakers that you'll come across that will say exciting claims. Let's just review one of these claims about Nineveh. Hmm. Well, I challenge you, go home and study about Nineveh. How many Ninevehs are there the claim has been made that there were seven Ninevehs in the path of this uh, eclipse that's going to cross America. Seven of them, right? Well, those that did the geological study found there were only six in the entire United States. Some of them were not towns. Some of them were townships where there was nobody living there. Um, some were for basically uh, uh, subdivisions. Okay? The first one was in Indiana. Okay? Uh, there is a small village there. Um, it is indeed in the path of the eclipse. Uh, 
Two others are in Missouri. Neither of the townships contain a village called Nineveh, and neither of those townships even fall into the total eclipse. The fourth one was found in New York. It did not lie in the path of totality. The fifth one is in Pennsylvania. It also is outside the total eclipse. And this, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, is the last Nineveh listed. So we have to dig further to come up with seven. The sixth one was found in Virginia, and nobody in the state of Virginia was able to act, is going to be able to see full totality during this eclipse. Number seven, this one that's so-called in Texas, is not marked on any maps, does not have a post office, and it also, as some claim where it is, by word of mouth, yeah, they live down in Nineveh. There is no place officially there, but it is also outside of the zone of totality. And then if you want to go further, there's another one in Ohio, but it's not found on maps, no post office, and no census data regarding it. So there's seven that are in the pathway. The man made the claim. Did you believe it? Let me encourage you. Don't just believe everything you hear. Discernment checks things out. Amen. This is what we are encouraged to do by the Lord. Okay? Uh, so there are many false prophets. When a man gets out and starts making these claims, let me ask this. Who, and we're still under the question, are there false prophets today? Uh, who made him the authority on this issue? Why are we listening to him? Why, why is he worthy of our attention and our time? And uh, are his words infallible? Obviously, obviously not. There's only one thing that's infallible, and that's the Word of God. Amen. If you're teaching the Word of God, that's the truth. And so when someone gets all excited about what's going on here with an eclipse and they're passing things around, just stop and, and say, you know, we should be like the Bereans. What was the, the character trait of the Berean church? They searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And I encourage you to do that. I have been challenged a few times from what I have preached. And I have on occasion said, hmm, I never thought of it that way. Thank you for guiding me. I'll listen. But there are others that are just like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't agree with you. Like, well, let's go to the Word of God. Let the Word of God be the authority. That's the only thing that's infallible. I am fallible. Every preacher and teacher is fallible. By the way, if I make a claim that this is a sign that God is going to do something and He's going to judge America, if I make a claim about the future and it doesn't come through, what does God think of that? What did He tell the Israelites to do to a false prophet in the Old Testament? According to the Mosaic Law, Take them out and stone them. God does not view false prophets in a very good light. So be very careful about when you hear people making claims about such and such is going to happen. So that's two things. Um, is this of the Bible? Number two, are there false prophets today? Number three, is this a distraction? Is this a distraction? Um, any believer that is distracted from doing his daily duty is a believer that is not accomplishing anything for God. We, we don't have the time in our short lives to be distracted. There's a million things that can be done. Many of them should be done, but not all of them can be done in our strength that's limited and in our time that's limited. We constantly have to focus on, what does God want me to do? The enemy of the best is good. We can do a lot of good things, but we're not doing the best. So watch out for distractions. Um, there was a huge distraction that occurred one time when I was teaching Bible classes um, back in 1988. I was teaching in a high school, and I'm telling you what, there was the rage Everything was, all the discussion in 1988 was the result of a pastor who had written a book in Pensacola, Florida. 
and it was being mass copied and published and distributed and the entire city was taken by this book and it was spreading across the nation and, and there was all this rumor and the title of the book was this, 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 1988. Some of you are nodding your head. You're like, you remember hearing that? Okay. And I was teaching Bible classes to 8th graders. How weird is that? 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. What's the Bible number 8? Oh, look up the numerological terms. Um, and so, guess what? Big surprise. Give you a hint. Jesus didn't come in... 1988. Have you noticed? Yeah. Okay. So after Jesus didn't come, the man printed another book. 89 reasons why he's coming in 89. And you know what the extra one was? I'm sorry, I forgot there was no year zero. So we went from 1 BC to AD 1. Okay. So he said, oh, there was no year zero. My math was off. And guess what? After that, his people didn't appreciate uh, his position quite as much. But he still had a following, and there was all this discussion. And, and you know, I step back, and I look at that and say, distraction. How many of you are out there trying to win the loss? If you really believed that he was coming in 1988, how many children did you go reach for a bus ministry? How many children did you go up and bring to Sunday school? How many lost loved ones did you call and talk to? How many people weren't doing what they should be doing? They were all caught up about talking and reading the book. It was a distraction. There's another distraction that occurred several years ago while we were living here. I actually met people that were like, uh, Pastor, this, this is going to be the greatest thing to bring revival to America. It's going to turn us upside down. All the evil will be done away. Bars will close. Uh, I mean, this is going to be a fantastic revival. And it's all because Mel Gibson put together a movie called <laughs> The Passion. <laughs> and I heard that and I said, mm-hmm. Okay. And they were so sold on this. We've got to get people to the theater. We've got to get them in there. We've got to watch this. It's going to bring revival to America. Uh, I'm still waiting for results from that. Really? It's a distraction. Let's just be plodders. There's no excitement in plodding. Plodding means you, almost in drudgery, take the next step. I think about old man Doug Hilliard. <laughs> Old man Doug. I call him that because when he went into the army, how old was he? 30, 30, 30 years old. Okay, here he's with all these 18 year olds. So now he's in for 23 years. He's in for 20, okay. Um, and so for at age 50, he's doing 12 mile ruck marches <laughs> with 40 pound ruck sacks at 50 years old. Wow. I said, Doug, how do you do it? I would have to have an ambulance slowly following behind me because I know I'm not going to make it. And he said, one step at a time. He said, and by the way, don't look up. Just keep looking at your feet. <laughs> yeah, just keep, just keep looking at your feet. And there's no excitement, there's no thrill in plodding. You know, the Christian life is plodding. Just keep being faithful. I'm just talking to you tonight about from a shepherd's viewpoint as a pastor. Uh, when you see things like this, uh, ask, is there any of this in the Bible? Number two, are there false prophets today? Yeah. And number three, is this a distraction? We need to be careful. What did Jesus say when he was 12 years old? He said, know ye not that I must be about my father's business? I'm just going to spend my days doing God's work. And then also, what did Jesus say before he ascended to glory? He said, occupy till I come. Now, I don't mean go sit down on Wall Street and have a protest. <clears throat> occupy Wall Street and occupy here and all that. No, that's not occupying. What does occupy mean? Occupy means you have an occupation. That means you are working. 
Jesus said, keep working. Never take your foot off the gas. Don't coast. Don't retire. By the word, retire means that you put on a new tread and you just keep on going. That's what occupy till I come means. That's what we're supposed to do. Don't allow distractions to uh, distract you, okay? Fourth question. That's yeah, not actually a question. It's just a statement here. Um, seek wisdom from above. Turn to James chapter 3. Seek wisdom from above. Did you know there is wisdom that is not from God, but it's still called wisdom? James chapter 3, verse 15 through 18. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown of them that make peace. There is a wisdom, and that means you, you understand something, it makes sense. You look at the facts and you say, oh, everything they're saying seems to make sense. And according to the unsaved mind, it might be very wise or common sense. But it's not God's wisdom. So we must have discernment to learn the difference between wisdom of this world and wisdom from above. Now, part of that he tells us in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. In order to determine if something is wisdom of the world or wisdom from above, he gives us practical advice. 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There are many, many. If you haven't seen one in a while, just turn on TV evangelists, right? Uh, They're going to say, if you send me $10, God will bless you and multiply you, uh, and you'll get a hundredfold or a thousandfold, and 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 God, you help me buy my new jet, and everything's going to be great with you. Um, Hey, beware. If you haven't seen a false prophet in a while, maybe you're not having your eyes open enough. They're everywhere. People that can tell you this is what the future's going to be. Listen to me. Don't listen to them. And so, I, I've heard things about, from psych, the world of psychiatry, that there are people who are now saying that you can experience visions during this eclipse that are going to reveal your future. Okay? I always think about dreams as, man, uh, like um, Ebenezer Scrooge did in Charles Dickens' novel um, when... Uh, Ebenezer Scrooge saw that, quote, ghost. He thought Jacob Marley had, who had appeared to him, and he says, oh, you're a bit of underdone potato. You're a bit of undercooked potato, and I ate it, and it's causing me stomach aches. And usually if someone says they've had a dream, I say, how much spicy pizza did you have before you went to bed? God is not speaking in dreams today. But there are people going around that are, do you see how far out this... People today, and this ought to burden our hearts, people today don't have any footing and grounding in truth. They don't. They try to interpret things, and they hear stuff like this, and they go like, oh my goodness, maybe this is a sign from God, and they listen to the wrong voices, and they know not the Scriptures. Jesus said, you err not knowing the Scriptures. That's our job. We need to learn the Scriptures. So seek wisdom from above. And so if you see something that really looks neat, and um, you, want, you see it on Facebook, um, think twice before you uh, pass it along, or share, or hit like. Or something like that. Let me just tell you, I have a, um, another alternative to Facebook. I do. And it's not, it's not uh, Truth Social or anything like that. I, I, for those that don't understand my old generation, I just tell you what, what I do. I'm trying to make friends, real friends, outside of Facebook. 
by applying the same principles. Therefore, every day as I walk down the street, <coughs> I tell passerbys, uh, passersby what I have eaten, how I feel at the moment, what I have done the night before, what I will later do, and with whom. I give them pictures of my family, my dog, and of me gardening, taking things apart in the garage, watering the lawn, standing in front of landmarks, driving around town, having lunch, and doing what anybody and everyone else does every day. I listen to their conversations, and I give them a thumbs up and tell them that I like them. And if <laughs> this just works exactly like Facebook, because already I have four people following me. <laughs> Two police officers, a predator, and a psychiatrist. So, oh my goodness. So be careful with uh, social media. And I know I've dated myself because the younger generation doesn't even, I mean, Facebook is for old people. Um, I'm really old because I don't have any social media on my phone. I don't. Now, I sit down with my wife and we look at it. And we laugh, and that's our fun for the day. But I don't do anything. My, my sons call me a stalker because I just look but don't post. Uh, and that, that's the fun. So back to our questions here. Number five, have mature biblical discernment. Is every revival a real revival? When someone says they led someone to Christ, we do say amen, but I would encourage you this. Say amen, I sure hope so. Because when someone makes a decision for Christ, they may not be saved. Our world all around us is so confused as to what salvation is. People are making commitments and getting baptized all over the place, and I'm not even sure they're saved. And so let's not get so excited. I mean, you have to have a reservation there to say, this is biblical mature discernment that says, oh, I hope they're genuinely saved, but I'm not going to put my stamp of approval on that because I don't know. By their fruits you shall know them. How many people have made a decision and then never, ever, ever darken the doors of a church? Many. Many. Rodney Meyer is one of the most wonderful missionaries. He's now, uh, uh, we've supported him for 20 years. He, he's now the director of the board. He told me this. He said over there in Tanzania, he worked on the, uh, uh, with a guy for months and months and months. And he said, finally, one day, he said, when are you going to pray and trust Jesus as your Savior? He said, if I thought if I got firm with him, he would finally do it. And so the man prayed a prayer. After that, he never saw him again. And Rodney very humbly said, I realized that day that I had a convert, but Christ didn't. Because the man just went away. Went, you know, I've got to get rid of this guy pressuring me. I'll just pray this. M many will say to me in that day, did we not do these things? Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. We need to have discernment. Yes, I get excited, but I'm also reserved when I hear about someone getting saved. There's a church... I won't say the name of it. I've actually been there to a conference, but it's located in North Carolina. And they have claimed, since their pastor has been there for 60 years, for in his 60-year ministry, that church has led and been responsible for leading 4 million people to Christ. That's interesting. That's more than the entire population of the state. Really? Uh, we're talking about a lot of stuff that maybe people are making decisions and people getting points and they're building their ministries up on, on charts with numbers and, and are they even saved? Yeah. And at what point are we actually doing detriment to the cause of Christ when they're not saved but they think they're okay? We need to be careful. We need to have mature biblical discernment. Um, uh, is the earth flat because it's shared online all the time by a lot of people? We've got some Facebook friends that are just like everything they put is, you round earthers are so dumb. You're, the earth is flat. Like, okay. Yeah, just because you see it on the internet does not mean it's right. And now let me just share one more thing to, with you, and that is about having discernment. 
Um, we need to be very cautious about Hollywood producing Bible stories for us. Um, there's one going around. I have not seen it, and it may be one of your favorites. I told my wife, I hope I don't hurt anybody's feelings. Um, I hope that they will love me anyway. But there's a series that's called The Chosen. I wanted to have discernment about this. It was initiated and inspired by a partnership between Dallas Jenkins, an evangelical filmmaker, and three Mormon businessmen, Jeffrey and Neil Harmon and Daryl uh, Eves. The Mormon influence on The Chosen is quite considerable. The executive producer is Mormon. The distributor is Mormon. Certain episodes were shot on special Mormon sets in Utah, and the crowdfunding and media exp uh, expertise is provided by Mormons. The Chosen director, co-writer, and chief publicist Dallas Jenkins has gone on record stating that the Mormon Jesus is the same as the Bible's Jesus. It is not. As Brother Willis said, the, the Mormon Jesus is not God. He is a created being. Okay, so here's a list of some of the attributes of a Mormon Jesus. One, he is Lucifer's brother. That's not in Scripture. Number two, Jesus is a spirit child that was conceived through physical means between an exalted man who we now call Heavenly Father and the Virgin Mary. Number three, Jesus is not eternal. He had a beginning, so therefore he is not part of the triune God. Number four, Jesus was not always God, but earned his way to Godhood just like you and I can today. Dallas Jenkins told one interviewer that 95% of the content of this video series called The Chosen is not from the Bible. This means that The Chosen is almost completely man's word, not God's. For example, Mary Magdalene backsliding is not in the Bible. Matthew, portrayed as an autistic, is not in the Bible. Jesus rehearsing his sermon on the mount is not in the Bible. The apostle Peter had a gambling debt that pressured him to fish overtime on the Sabbath to pay back what he owed. <laughs> I don't see that in the Bible either. Jonathan Rumi, the actor who plays Jesus in The Chosen, is a fervent Catholic with a strong affinity toward New Age. He claims to have had a, quote, personal interaction with a deceased Catholic saint. Rumi's recommended reading list on Amazon includes The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything by Jesuit priest and New Age sympathizer James Martin. The book openly teaches the pantheistic New Age doctrine of God being in everyone and everything, and uh, as the following quotes from the book illustrate, quote, God can be found in everything and everyone too. We'll look at how to find God in everything and everything in God in this book. So I, I want to just go back over the five questions. What are they? The five questions. Is any of this in the Bible? I don't have time for it if it's not in the Bible. Right. Number two, will there be false prophets? Yeah. What are you doing to be on guard for that? Number three, is this a distraction? Yeah. Number four, am I seeking wisdom from above or the wisdom of man? Number six, am I exercising mature biblical discernment? That's an encouragement to you. Now, one final thought, and this is the real eclipse that I think you need to watch out for. Aye. Have a picture of that. There's the one. Okay. You have more danger from driving or walking in front of this than from any other eclipse. This one can kill you. Okay. But let me share with you something. Did you know that the symbol of Mitsubishi is a three diamond emblem? It's a combination of three, uh, of two words, mitsu, ishi, and I'm not good with my Japanese. Mitsu means three. Hishi, in the Japanese, when they merge together, they pronounce that H as a B, mitsubishi. Mitsu, hishi, means water chestnut that pictures a diamond shape. Ah, on the grill we see 
that Mitsuhishi, the Trinity of God. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is a sign from heaven. And you're laughing because anyone can make other people believe something about God if they don't have discernment. Need to have discernment and also watch out for Mitsubishi Eclipse. <laughs> Let's pray. God, we thank you for the time. I pray that you would just bless our church folks. We love you. We thank you. I pray that you would help us to be helpful to other people um, as we, dis as we uh, meet people and discuss things over the next several days. Lord, thank you for these great testimonies. Thank you for how you're growing your church. My heart is hurting for those who are physically hurting and also those who are spiritually struggling. Lord, please be with them. Strengthen them. I pray that each of us would grow to be more like you. And do, during these times of, of great troubled water, I ask you that you would just help us. Help us to glorify you are our loving, compassionate, forgiving, merciful God that will judge evil. No evil will escape your judgment, Jehovah. But also you bring about redemption to save us from our sin. Strengthen us, use us, help us to come back again to please you in Jesus' name. Amen.